Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today's topic is a, a topic that actually came up because of another show. Uh, one of the episodes on the current season of Criminalia, which is a different show that I do, uh, we are covering imposters this season. And there was a, a topic, an imposter, whose story made mention of Adolf Lorenz, the bloodless surgeon of Vienna. And I was instantly curious about that. And it was not really germane to explore in that episode. So uh, that popped over here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the incident that connected Dr. Lorenz to a fake doctor. But really, his life story is plenty compelling even without that odd little detail, including lots of surprises, like, you know, some protests to him within his industry, his his life story, how he was received and perceived by people. Uh, It's a good one. So we'll jump right in. Adolf Lorenz was born on April 21st, 1854 in Widenau, Silesia, which is today Vidnava, part of the Czech Republic. At the time, though, it was sat within the Austrian Empire. This was not a wealthy family. Adolf's father, Johann Lorenz, worked as a saddler and as an innkeeper. His mother was Agnes Ehrlich Lorenz. And after elementary school, Adolf moved south to the city of Graz to live with his uncle from his mother's side. And he also, as part of that move, started an apprenticeship as a shopkeeper in a general store. He didn't really like that very much. Uh, And while his life's work became medicine, in some ways he got there because as a child he was a decent singer. Uh, As a young boy, his vocal talent led him to be chosen as a member of the boys' choir of St. Paul Benedictine Monastery in Carinthia, Austria. And that meant that he could attend school there for free. He did not have to pay a fee for it. And it was through this move that he was able to gain really a strong enough foundation of early education that he could then go on to higher education. When Lorenz was 16, he moved from the monastery at Carinthia to high school in Klagenfurt near Austria's southern border. During this time, he brought in money by working as a tutor for students from wealthy families. He really barely got by financially, but when he finished at the age of 20, he started his formal medical training. He moved to Vienna for that. And this was an area where Adolf Lorenz showed promise from just the very beginning. While still a student, he was offered the chance to take a job as an anatomy instructor because he demonstrated such a thorough knowledge of the subject. This really helped keep him afloat financially while he worked toward the bigger goal of wanting to become a surgeon. Yeah, I've read some accounts that say, like, he got so skilled in the subject of anatomy because that was one of the things he was tutoring students at in his his prior school. Lorenz graduated from medical school in 1880 at the age of 26, and he got a job as an assistant to an orthopedic surgeon named Johann von Dumrocker at the Rudolfiner House Hospital in Vienna. Dumrocker died not long after Lorenz began working with him, and he was replaced by Edouard Albert, who kept Adolf on as his assistant. But as Lorenz became more and more indispensable to Albert, a problem began to emerge. At this time in history, carbolic acid was routinely used during surgeries because of its effectiveness in killing bacteria. And it turned out that Lorenz was allergic to it. He developed severe dermatitis any time he was in contact with it. Edouard Albert didn't want his promising assistant to abandon medicine altogether because of this problem. So he asked him, quote, if you cannot get along with wet surgery, why not try dry surgery? And this is the genesis point of what would eventually be called bloodless surgery by Lorenz. So we should note here, the term bloodless surgery has a very different meaning today than what we're talking about here. If you Google it, you will find very different things. Uh, Today, bloodless surgery is an approach to surgical procedures that uses no transfusions of blood from a donor source. But for Lorenz, that term was used in a sense of no blood being drawn. He did not make incisions in his patients. So the work that he did would be more accurately described in today's terms as orthopedic manipulation. It was carefully moving and shifting a patient's skeletal structure to correct problems and improve their mobility. 
And this was a really very new area of medicine in the 1800s. And Lorenz, with his masterful understanding of anatomy, was really drawn to it. Early on in his career, Lorenz started working primarily with children. He developed treatments that used a series of plaster casts to correct pediatric orthopedic problems as his patients grew. Over several years, he developed treatments for several congenital conditions, including scoliosis, hip dislocation, and clubfoot. And soon Lorenz began publishing books about his work, detailing, for example, the various mechanical means that he used to correct scoliosis. In treating clubfoot, Lorenz developed a system that stretched the patient's tendons and ligaments over time and then put the affected leg in a final stage leg cast and it stayed there until it was healed in the proper position. But it was really hip dislocation that became his specialty. So this is a situation where during fetal development, the hip joint doesn't form as it should. It's not aligned properly, and that creates an instability in the joint that worsens as the child grows. You'll also see this referred to as developmental dysplasia. And Dr. Lorenz's approach was, as with his other treatments, all about slowly forcing the head of the femur into its proper position using a series of casts along with traction and surgical manipulation. Again, no incisions. One contemporary description of the Lorenz method for treating congenital hip displacement describes the first stage as one where the child is placed under anesthesia and the operator manipulates the leg to stretch and sometimes even tear the muscles of the leg so that they're not pulling on the femur. Next, the operator manipulates and shifts the femur until it, quote, drops into the socket. Then, quote, to prevent relocation, the leg is drawn out sideways to an angle of 90 degrees and is held in this position by a plaster cast. After a brief period of recovery, the child would be encouraged to use the leg as part of recovering, although there was an anticipated six-month to two-year period of being in a cast. Lorenz estimated the success rate with this is about 60%. That seems low to me, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I, my knowledge of orthopedic procedures is nil. So, in 1884, Lorenz got married to a woman named Emma Lecker, and their wedding took place on October 5th of that year. Eleven months later, the couple had a son, Albert, on September 2nd, 1885. Albert would eventually follow his father into orthopedics. And then much later in 1903, Adolf and Emma had a second son, Conrad, who went into the animal behavior field. In 1889, Lorenz was granted a special professorship position at the University of Vienna so he could share his methods with the medical students there. He taught his approach to the students and researchers and other doctors Among his colleagues in Austria, he gained the nickname Gipsdozent, or plaster teacher. Yeah, that's one of those things that people often note, like, hey, that sounds almost kind of like uh, an insult, but he didn't really seem to mind. According to Lorenz, he was asked to consult in the case of young King Alfonso XIII of Spain. Alfonso had been born a king. His father had died not long before he was born, and his mother, Maria Cristina, who was serving as regent, was Austrian. So... She reached out to the Austrian doctor, who was already seen of something as a miracle worker, to treat her son, who was reportedly just generally sort of weak after a childhood bout with the flu during the 1889-1890 pandemic. He did, of course, you know, uh, after treatment, continue to live and rule, so presumably things went well. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, things were very busy for Adolf. He published his book On the Healing of Congenital Hip Dislocation in 1896, That year, he also became an advisor to the Austrian government. In 1901, he co-founded the German Orthopedic Society. He gave numerous lectures at medical conferences explaining his techniques, and then he started traveling the world to meet demand for his treatments. In just a moment, we're going to talk about the wealthy patient whose treatment rocketed Lorenz onto the public stage. But first, we're going to pause and have a little sponsor break. By 1902, Adolf Lorenz's reputation was so well established that he was requested to travel to Chicago by the wealthy Armour family to treat Lolita Armour. 
that is incidentally the same armor family name you have likely seen in your local grocery store because they made their fortune in meatpacking. Lolita had congenital hip dislocation, and Dr. Lorenz treated one of her hips. She had already had surgery on them performed by a doctor named John Ridlin. And while that first surgery was initially reported as a success, before long, one of her hips was displaced again, and that was when her parents reached out to Dr. Lorenz. The arrival of a doctor from Europe intending to practice medicine in the U.S. got the attention of the Illinois Board of Health. That board insisted that he needed to be licensed in the state before he treated anyone. There were both supporters and detractors for this, and plenty of Lorenz's supporters saw it as an insult to the man and his work. But Dr. Lorenz didn't seem to mind and consented to take the state board exam, which he passed. Yeah, that's an issue that comes up again later. Uh, The Chicago Tribune ran a lengthy article shortly after the procedure in which Lorenz described the whole thing of that that first initial treatment in detail. He told the Tribune, quote, It required about two hours to perform the operation. The right leg was drawn down until the end of the femur reached the socket where it could rest. Then I turned the limb out at right angles and applied a heavy dressing. Over this was placed a thick plaster of Paris cast, which will hold it in place until spring. The cast is so placed that it will allow free movement of the knee so that it will be possible for the little girl to walk after two or three weeks. She will be able to sit up in a few days and will not suffer much at any time. It was reported in the papers that Lorenz received a whopping $75,000 for treating six-year-old Lolita Armour. But also in his time in Chicago, he visited numerous hospital wards to consult and treat patients for free. This was something that he did any time he was in the States throughout his life. After World War I, he told the press he would always do it because the U.S. had helped the children of Austria with food and supplies during the conflict. This treatment of the beloved child of one of the richest families in the United States came with a significant amount of media attention. I mean, this was like a headline event in a lot of papers. After his work with Lolita, when he was expected to visit a city, there were always multiple write-ups in the local press about it. And as a consequence, lines of people would form outside of any hospital he was expected to visit to give these free clinics, made up of parents just hoping that he could offer their child a little bit of hope and possibly some treatment. When he moved on to Baltimore after Chicago to see patients there, interest was so great among other medical practitioners that one of his bloodless surgeries had to become a ticketed event just to try to manage the crowd that wanted to observe. They didn't charge money for these tickets, but it was basically like, if you didn't get a ticket, you cannot come in. While he was in the D.C. area, he was also invited to meet President Theodore Roosevelt. So that gives you a sense of just how big a name he was at this point. But there were also plenty of doctors who were really flummoxed by all the media attention around this doctor who was doing things they didn't feel like were groundbreaking at that point. In the Literary Digest in 1902, an article was included titled The Significance of Dr. Lorenz's Visit. That quotes from another article in The Independent. According to that write-up, quote, Professor Lorenz does not come to teach our American orthopedic surgeons are specialists in the treatment of deformed children, something they did not know before. Lorenz's operation has been practiced in this country for almost, if not quite, a decade of years, and some of the best results attained by the use of the method invented by the Vienna professor have been exported from America. The point made in this writing is that the significance that was referenced in the title of the article was really that the press around Lorenz's work meant that a larger number of people in the U.S. knew about that work and they might seek treatment. Not suggesting that the significance was that it was really all that new. No, they did credit him for really uh, pioneering some treatments, but they were like, yeah, but we've all been doing it for a while at this point. (laughs) um, And it was one of those things where for a lot of families, particularly uh, families that did not have a whole lot of income, there was kind of an expectation prior to this that if you had a child that had an orthopedic problem, you kind of taught them to live with it rather than getting it treated and that this shifted that idea a little bit. 
Uh, Lorenz was asked to visit other cities when he returned to the U.S. in 1903 for his follow-up care with Lolita Armour. He was invited to speak at the American Medical Association's annual meeting in New Orleans in 1903, and he accepted that. He also visited Dallas, Texas, right after that appearance, and that visit is credited with inspiring the construction of what would become the Baylor Medical Center. That press and the popularity that Lorenz had gained in the U.S. came with some problems. Many members of the medical community in the U.S. thought that Lorenz and showing up and only seeing patients briefly was really creating more problems than he solved. Right. Remember, these are long-term treatments. They're not super quick. So it's like you're giving them hope, but you can't really do the follow-through if you then go back to Vienna. Almost 20 years after he had been called to Chicago to treat Lolita Armour and having returned to North America repeatedly to see sometimes hundreds of patients a day at any hospital he visited, he was once again planning a trip to the U.S. in 1921 when a public statement was issued by a group of Chicago doctors who thought that Lorenz should not be allowed to practice medicine in their facilities. In an article covering this Chicago uproar, the New York Times listed St. Luke's, Presbyterian Hospital, Children's Memorial, and the Home for Destitute Crippled Children among those hospitals that were very adamant in their stance that Dr. Lorenz was not welcome there. This statement made by the Collective of Orthopedic Surgeons, which honestly, like the name of the hospital that we just read, contains some very outdated language that's offensive by today's standards, That statement reads, quote, The proposed visit of Dr. Lorenz will accomplish more harm than good, and we are opposed to any plan by which countless numbers of cripples will have their hopes raised to the skies, only to have them blasted when they find they have been misled. His visit will serve only to make every cripple in America dissatisfied and disappointed. Some would be disappointed because they were unable to reach the, quote, miracle man, Others, because he would not be able to treat them. As a matter of fact, all those who came in contact after he left with the many cases which Professor Lorenz operated upon during his former visit saw many results they were glad they were not responsible for and for which they felt Professor Lorenz would have been heartily ashamed could he have stayed in the country to take care of them. At the end of the statement, the group affirms that Lorenz's presence is an insult to the orthopedists already working in Chicago, that he can't do anything they can't do themselves, and that they will not give follow-up treatment to any patient he treats. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because on the one hand, they're saying he's doing things that are hurting people, and then they also say those are the same exact things we're already doing. And so it's a little like, wait a minute, there's some... You're contradicting yourself a little bit here. (laughs) Um, The controversy around Lorenz's 1921 trip to the U.S. continued. And when Lolita Armour's case was brought into the discussion as not having been the success that it was touted as in the early 1900s, it was the Armour heiress herself, at this point an adult married woman, who came to his defense. She said, quote, I cannot say that a perfect cure has been effected in either hip, but the hip treated by Dr. Lorenz is far better than the other one, which he could do little with because it had been too badly mishandled, he said. I myself believe that had it not been for the work done before he was called on my case, he would have effected a complete cure. She also gave the statement to a paper, quote, Dr. Lorenz is undoubtedly a much better orthopedic surgeon than any we have in this country. He proved that when he cured me after all others here failed. Lorenz's problems with access to U.S. medical facilities continued well beyond Chicago. When he was invited to visit various New York clinics by Health Commissioner Royal S. Copeland, the staff members at several hospitals protested. There was also a statement from the State Board of Education making clear that Lorenz was not licensed in New York and warning him not to perform any surgeries. On top of that controversy, news broke on December 3rd, 1921, that the assistant who had been helping Dr. Lorenz in New York was not a doctor assigned to him by the health commissioner, as he had claimed to be, but was in fact a man with no medical credentials simply posing as a doctor. 
That man was Steven Weinberg, who was a serial imposter. This is the the story we referenced at the top of the show. And in the case of Dr. Lorenz, he had met Lorenz's ship at the dock when it arrived, and he introduced himself to Lorenz as Dr. Clifford Wayman, who was sent to assist the visiting orthopedist. And in his guide, Weinberg was accepted at his word. But to be clear, uh, he wasn't performing any medical procedures or therapies in this ruse. He was basically handling administrative needs for Lorenz, such as managing appointments and taking notes during meetings. This ruse lasted a week before an anonymous tip was called into the hospital where Lorenz was working, and the imposter was quickly replaced with a more appropriate assistant. But this whole thing was more bad press for Lorenz, which did not help his situation. The protests eventually led the city health department to rule on December 10th, 1921, that Dr. Lorenz could not perform any of his surgeries himself in New York, but could direct other doctors in what to do, and they could do it and remain within the letter of the law. He was notified of this and sent the forms he would need to fill out to apply for his license the New York State Board of Regents, who supported Lorenz's work, accelerated the process and issued him a special license to address the matter. As a consequence, Lorenz did perform an estimated 20 orthopedic surgeries in his visit to New York and saw more than 2,000 other patients. Throughout his years of visiting the U.S., crowds had continued to gather in the hope of getting treatment from him during his charity clinics. Yeah, there are uh, press photos and even some early newsreels of literally just crowds outside of hospitals waiting for him to arrive and hoping that they can get their child in to see him. Lorenz never lacked for supporters, even when protests against him within the medical community were at their height. On January 2nd, 1922, so just a month after all of that hubbub, uh, the New York Daily News ran a short piece that was titled Better Late Than Never. And that piece opened with, quote, Adolf Lorenz, Viennese surgeon, has been granted a license to practice in the state of New York. Thus, after weeks of delay, the State Board of Regents has started to make amends to a man who came to the American people in altruism and who was paid in abuse. Hidden behind the adverse criticism was professional jealousy. Adolf Lorenz suffered his name and pictures to occupy countless newspaper front pages. It isn't done in the American medical profession. It isn't ethical. We're going to talk about a questionable surgery that Dr. Lorenz had to try to treat his lagging energy. But we will pause for a minute first to hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Miss in History Class going. In 1923, Dr. Lorenz made headlines not as a medical practitioner, but as a patient when he had a, quote, rejuvenation surgery that was performed by Dr. Eugene Steinock, also of Vienna. And this surgery followed a period in which Lorenz had collapsed from exhaustion several times while visiting hospitals in the U.S., But the Steinock procedure, which was touted as a means for aging men to regain their youthful energy and vitality, was really just a partial vasectomy. Steinock, who had plenty of problematic ideas about sexual health and gender identity and de-aging treatments, believed that his procedure would cause the body to be flooded with hormones and result in increased energy. This procedure was a fad for a time, but it was, of course, eventually discredited. As for Lorenz, he always spoke very highly of the results and how much better he felt after having the surgery. But the reality was that this had been done as a secondary procedure that he had while also undergoing prostate surgery. So it's very likely that his improvement was really the result of having a more serious issue addressed. This is one of those things that kind of gets talked about because it involves, I imagine, personal things and also because people don't understand it in these very sort of hazy, cloaked references. And I think nobody really understood what was being done in the the general press. Uh, And so it is one of those things of like, oh, the surgery fixed everything for him. They didn't really understand what was done or what else he was having done at the same time. The year after the rejuvenation surgery... Adolf Lorenz retired from active practice, but he kept visiting the U.S. regularly for the next 13 years to consult with doctors and patients, primarily in New York. In the early 1930s, Lorenz was asked by the press to weigh in on whether paralysis would negatively impact a person's ability to lead. This was part of an effort to create a commentary on the health of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
When asked about it, Lorenz, who was speaking specifically about infantile paralysis, stated, quote, this disease does not in the least affect mental qualities. It has absolutely nothing to do with the brain. A person stricken may get crooked limbs, but will never get a crooked brain. The person who has had infantile paralysis could never be your run champion, but he could be king, emperor, president, executive, or whatever else needs like qualifications. Lorenz cited the thousands of patients he had seen in his 50-plus years of practice who had some level of paralysis, none of which appeared to him to be mentally affected. He also worked on his autobiography during this time, which was published in 1936 and was titled My Life and Work. And this book got pretty mixed reviews. Most write-ups about it note that it comes off as really self-aggrandizing. Fellow orthopedist Dr. Frank D. Dixon wrote a review of Lorenz's autobiography in the October 1936 issue of the American Journal of Public Health. And that review reads in part, quote, The revealing side of the book lies in its frank egoism and egotism. That Dr. Lorenz gave himself undue supremacy in his thoughts is evident from the very beginning of the book. That he gave himself undue prominence in speech becomes a conviction as the last word is read. That Dr. Lorenz contributed greatly to the advancement of orthopedic surgery is unquestioned. That he was a superman accomplishing cures that were beyond the skill of others is open to debate. Yet his words can leave no other impression than that he felt that he stood out above all others of his guild. Dr. Lorenz died on February 12, 1946, at the age of 91 in Altenburg, Austria, which is northwest of Vienna. And a lot of the treatments that Lorenz developed have been refined, of course, significantly over the years. But a lot of them still often resemble Dr. Lorenz's approach. The most common treatment for club foot in babies is still a series of casts to correct the position of the leg and foot as the child grows. Scoliosis has a wide range of treatments now, depending on the severity of a patient's condition and their age, from spinal bracing to surgical procedures. And congenital hip dislocation is treated in a variety of ways today, from a soft splint known as a pavlic harness in infants to full surgeries. I know we touched on this earlier, but uh, it just made me think about how also there was a common treatment for scoliosis, which was to do nothing, which I am pretty sure was the course of action for my grandmother. Yeah, (laughs) lots of people never got treated. Rehemming all of her skirts because they were an inch too long on one side because her hips were uneven. Like, yeah, that was the level of of, uh, attention paid to that. So, Lorenz, as we've discussed... Uh, drew criticism as well as praise during his lifetime. And even today, it becomes difficult to grapple with some of the things that he said over the years. One of the most difficult, and one which is often left out of discussions of his life, is his really ableist views on children who were born with all kinds of medical challenges. In his book, My Life and Work, he asserts that it's better for children with some conditions to die than to live in, quote, untold misery and suffering. He also stated while visiting New York in late 1935 that two members of his family, a daughter-in-law and an uncle who were, quote, incurably diseased, had been given excessive narcotics to hasten their deaths as a form of mercy killing. And during that same interview, he said he believed that every physician has probably been a mercy killer and that he would want the same for himself. In contrast to those controversial and troubling ideas, Lorenz also had some strong feelings about quality of life that are far less problematic and actually fairly insightful. He believed that the, quote, American way of life, as he witnessed it evolving in the early 20th century, was at its core unhealthy. In 1926, he gave an interview in which he expressed a belief that the pursuit of prosperity that was driving culture in the United States was only going to make life worse for most people. He noted that while at home in Austria prior to World War I, he was considered well-off and successful, though not rich by U.S. standards. But he lost his small fortune in World War I and was able to continue on with his life without much anxiety because he felt his greatest assets were his health and his ability to find happiness, not his finances. Some of his words on this topic were laid out graphically, almost as though it were a poem, as the lead-in to an article in the Miami Herald in February 1926. And it reads in part, quote, 
You live too swiftly, and your ever-increasing pace kills and is killing you. Your great fault, as I see it, is the tendency to overdo. More and more, you make life a fitful fever. You regard life as a race course, along which you must tear at heart-straining speed. You refuse to stroll in its happy vales or to tarry in its peaceful gardens. Your almost hysterical mode of living may be productive of financial results, but you will pay a penalty in nerve-wracked bodies and shortened lives. If you would be healthy and happy and live your allotted span, you must practice moderation in all things. You rush through your work, you rush through your play, you rush through your meals, you rush through romance, and you rush to your graves. In the last decades of his life, Adolf Lorenz was nominated for a Nobel Prize in Medicine eight times. He never won, though. His younger son, Conrad, did with the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his work in animal behavior in 1973. There's always secret horror. (laughs) (laughs) That is always the lesson. Definitely. Uh, Yeah. Do you have listener mail for us? Yes. Uh, This is... um, uh, also medical, har- uh, sort of, hearkening back to our our episode on John Dalton. Uh, it is from our listener, Erica, who uh, says, I really enjoyed your episode on John Dalton, and especially Holly's note about learning that her dad had anomalous color vision very late in life. It reminds me of a friend of mine. We were at a weekend gathering, and someone had brought a bag of wasabi-dried peas, which were brownish-red or brownish-green. We were all debating whether there was a difference in the spice levels between the two when my friend walked in and we asked his opinion. He ate a green one and gave it a thumbs up, and then we asked him to try a red one, and he laughed like we had told a joke. A bit confused, we asked him again. He chuckled again, but with far less certainty, and after one more round, it came out that he thought we were messing with him and that they were all the same color. Said friend was, at the time of this story, a 30-something engineer at a big software company. An immigrant to the country, he was married, he had generally lived in the world a great deal, and he discovered his own anomalous vision by way of a party snack. Uh, Incidentally, his wife came in shortly after and upon hearing this story laughed and said, well, that explains some things. Uh, Thank you so much for the podcast. I'm not keeping up as well as I did pre-pandemic, as my commute is no more. Don't worry, we all have fall-offs. There's nothing to apologize for. Me too, honestly. Yeah, uh, but I do enjoy listening to it while running and have turned my mom onto it as well. Best Erica. Thank you so much, Erica. And like I said, nobody ever apologized for falling behind. Time is finite and whatever you need to do to make the most of yours is great. Do that. Yes. Yeah, I also, <laughs> my podcast listening fell off because it was normally what I would have playing while I would walk to the grocery store or the library or you know, the the pharmacy or whatever. And um, during the pandemic, those walks greatly reduced. <laughs> right. None of us were uh, transiting in any manner quite as much. Uh, but uh, we thank you so much, Erica. And like I said, you know, it's always there to go back to. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. If you have not yet subscribed to the podcast and think that sounds like something you'd like to do, it is easy as pie. You can do it on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere else you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 